Good afternoon. The next item of business is portfolio questions on social justice, housing and local government. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button uh, uh, during the relevant question or enter the letter R in the chat function. As ever, I'd make a plea for succinct questions and answers to allow me to get in as many members as possible. I call question number one, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment has made of any benefits of paying the winter heating payment in November rather than February. Minister Ben McPherson. As I made clear to the Social Justice and Social Security Committee on the 15th of December, and again alluded to uh, this morning, some responses to our consultation suggested winter heating payments should be made earlier, uh, and I was open to reviewing bringing forward payments in future years. For the first year of the payment, which is uh, being paid today and in, and in the days and weeks ahead, it was not possible to make payments earlier since DWP were unable to provide the data required prior to the 31st of January. And as a reminder to Parliament, we will uh, ensure through this payment 400,000 low-income people are given a guaranteed £50 to help with their heating costs, no matter where they live. Uh, or whatever the weather is. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer, but this year the winter heating payment has missed the mark. It's come far too late after the worst of the weather has passed and has missed a number of people, including many, on disability benefits. So in this review, will he look at bringing the timetable forward and will he also look at expanding it to be paid to all those on adult disability benefits, whatever level they are on? I would disagree Sorry, with the sentiment um, in Mr Balfour's questions because um, I, I, the winter heating payment is a, on average huge expansion in support because on average in the last seven years only around 185,000 people received the UK equivalent in Scotland before it was replaced with winter heating payment uh, which was cold weather payments whereas today through our benefit 400,000 people are receiving support, guaranteed support, no matter where they live. And people who would not have got a cold weather payment in all likelihood in most winters, they are guaranteed a reliable payment now from the Scottish Government. We will continue to look at uh, how we can improve this benefit, as we do with all our benefits, and we'll do that in good faith. Um, and in terms of exploring the feasibility of moving payments forward in future years, I can confirm that engagement between the Scottish Government and DWP, DWP officials on that matter has already started. And supplementary, Emma Rosick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As, as the Minister has just outlined, the winter heating payment will pay out around £20 million to 400,000 people. That's more than double the £8.3 million provided by the DWP to only 185,000 households in each of the last seven years. And given that no cold weather payments were triggered in Shetland, Orkney, Wick, Glasgow, Edinburgh or Fife, last year. Does the Minister agree that this new system will ensure more people receive reliable support regardless of the weather and that it is therefore fairer? Minister. I think the member highlights really important matters because cold weather payments provide no guaranteed support and there are years where no one will receive anything. Um, last year, for example, only 11,000 people received a payment mm -hmm. and in 2019-20 in as few as 4,000 people received support. Um, this is why we have made the changes that we have with winter heating payment to make sure it's more reliable and not contingent on the location of weather stations, which also often do not reflect the conditions that people are experiencing. Our £20 million investment ensures that all of the 400,000 low-income individuals that uh, are entitled to this benefit will automatically receive a payment regardless of the temperature uh, or their location and I'm really glad that these payments are going out to people today and in the days and weeks ahead. Supplementary Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. One thing that the Minister has omitted to say is that nearly 100,000 people will actually lose money as a result of this because the weather has already dropped below the temperatures at which it would have in order for them to get some more money. So what is the Minister going to do to ensure those people's um, shortfall is is caught and also can the Minister guarantee that he will make sure there is enough data transferred in a enough time to make sure that the winter heating payments um, next year are paid in winter and not closer to spring as is the case in this one. 
Minister. I, I'm not sure uh, what uh, assessment is behind the statements that Pam Duncan Glancy has made around that figure of 100,000, because as far as I'm aware, um, uh, unless I'm not mistaken, the cold weather payments would have only been triggered once this winter to, to date. Uh, of course, only in certain places uh, where certain weather stations uh, record uh, a zero temperature for seven consecutive working days. Um, and of course, that, that one trigger uh, would only have initiated a payment of £25 for those people in those places. Whereas today, and in the days and weeks ahead, people are receiving £50 from the Scottish Government. More people, more money on average and a better system. That's what we're delivering and we're very proud to be doing so. Yeah. Question number two, Tess White. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what discussions it's had with COSLA about the delivery of local services over the next financial year. Minister Ben McPherson. Ministers and officials regularly meet with representatives from COSLA. Uh, indeed, the Cabinet Secretary and I had a meeting with the COSLA presidential team yesterday. Uh, and also ministers and officials regularly meet with individual local authorities to discuss a range of issues uh, as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government as two spheres of government to improve outcomes uh, for the people of Scotland. Uh, the impact uh, of the settlement will depend on how local authorities allocate the total resources available to them, uh, as was agreed in the budget uh, earlier this week, uh, and the level of service they then provide uh, over the next financial year. Um, the Scottish Government recognises the crucial role councils and their employees play uh, in our communities across Scotland and the, the, the challenging uh, financial circumstances they face, as does the Scottish Government. Tess White. Um, Minister Cosler cries of SOS Save Our Services have been ignored by this SNP Government. That will have a massive bearing on the ability of North East Councils to properly fund even statutory public services. Now there are even question marks over the Big Noise project in Torrey and the system are equivalent in Dundee. Aberdeen D and Dundee council Councils are struggling to find even the meagre resources required to support these transformational music projects for disadvantaged young people. Will the Minister commit to discussing with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy whether fair funding for councils can be enshrined into law to help protect services in future? Thank you. Minister. Um, in 2023-24, local authorities in the northeast of Scotland will receive over £1.7 billion to fund local services, which equates to an extra £124.7 million to support vital day-to-day -day services, or an additional 7.4 per cent compared with 22-23. Um, I commend the member in her representation of her constituents for raising important points around important projects in her region. And I would encourage her, uh, on behalf of those organisations, to continue engaging with both local authorities that, sh that uh, are um, within her region uh, and finance ministers. Uh, the, the Scottish Government has, as the member knows, uh, a largely fixed budget. We have used our taxation powers progressively, which of course uh, the member's party opposes. Uh, we have made allocations to significant social security payments, including what I referred to in my last answer. Um, what I think the Scottish Conservatives need to bring to this chamber, if they are serious about representing their constituents in the challenging financial circumstances we face, is proposals and solutions about reallocation of resources. Um, you cannot ask for more money without citing where that money will come from in a largely fixed financial envelope. Uh, we didn't see suggestions in this budget process, which of course concluded earlier this week. Um, I would encourage the Scottish Conservatives to raise their game in the financial year ahead. Uh, supplementary, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The Deputy First Minister announced an extra £100 million in the budget on Tuesday to cover 2.5% of the peer award to non-teaching staff. But the cost of that 2.5% is £155 million. So can I ask the Minister when the Government is likely to announce the additional funding to meet the Government's own commitments? Minister. Um, I would uh, thank the Member for, for his uh, question and uh, encourage uh, further engagement with Finance Ministers, who of course um, are uh, the pr principal ministers in, in, in regard to local government finance. Um, 
As the member alluded to, we are increasing the resource available to local government by over £793 million, which includes the £570 million from the budget announcement in December, plus, as Mr Griffin referred to, the additional £100 million for non-teaching pay in 2023-24, and £123 million towards the uh, support towards the teachers' pay negotiation, uh, negotiation announced at stage three of the budget bill announced by the, the Deputy First Minister yesterday. So um, we have announced uh, and, and, and con uh, what uh, I have referred to. We have concluded the budget, uh, uh, the budget process. Uh, of course, there are ongoing considerations around teachers' pay, uh, and ministers are very focused in, in finding solutions, working with our local government colleagues, uh, and helping to resolve these matters. Thank you. And before I call the next member seeking to ask a supplementary, I would say to the minister we would need to have a bit shorter uh, responses because otherwise we won't get all these members in seeking to ask questions. Co cap Stuart, supplementary. Uh, thank you. Um, does the minister share my appreciation for the work of SNP councillors on Glasgow City Council, who last week passed their budget? protecting vital services in the face of some of the most difficult times for Scottish public finances and living memory. And given that Labour councillors not only failed to present an alternative budget, but failed to turn up at all, what does, she, uh, what does he think of their actions say about their respect for democracy? Uh, and I perhaps should have added shorter questions as well. Minister. Um, in, in, with ease, I won't refer to deeply to, to what's been said and that I do think that in these, in these times it's, it's important that all elected members uh, act in a responsible way which involves um, making sure that they're present for important decisions. I call question number three, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has had with the UK Government regarding support that can be provided for women living in Scotland who are fleeing domestic violence and have no recourse to public funds. Minister Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. The Scottish Government is working to protect all women who flee abuse. We are clear that women with no recourse to public funds should be offered the same level of support as other women in Scotland and not face this disadvantage. We continue to engage with the UK Government to ensure all victims of domestic abuse are afforded the same protections and support. And our Ending Destitution Together strategy urges the UK Government to immediately remove and cease to apply no recourse to public funds conditions to people in vulnerable circumstances, including women experiencing domestic abuse. Rona Mackay. I thank the Minister for the answer. I am very heartened to hear that um, the Scottish Government will continue to press the UK Government for, powers, uh, for these powers and powers over immigration. And can the Minister confirm that when Scotland is independent, all women living in Scotland who are fleeing domestic abuse will have access to public funds? Minister. Yes, Presiding Officer. It is clear we need our own immigration system to address Scotland's distinct demographic, labour market and economic yeah. challenges. And we have set out previously how devolution of migration powers would work. Everyone in our community should have the right to access support in times of need, including people in the UK asylum and immigration systems. We have written to the UK Government urging them to reverse the policy of restricting applications for indefinite leave to remain for survivors of domestic abuse or um, violence and widen it to migrant survivors who are excluded from the concessions simply because they are not in the UK on a spousal visa. It is not acceptable that people, including those fle fleeing domestic abuse, face destitution or be forced to remain in unsafe conditions because of their immigration status. A supplementary Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Disproportionately, it is women that are left without recourse to public funds, having fled an abuser. And we know that the complex and inhumane system is almost impossible to navigate without support from outside organisations and legal assistance. And recognising the work that the Scottish Women's Rights Centre uh, conducts, so, and what, so what asks of the UK government are being put forward to help secure support and funding to help women in this situation? Minister. Uh, President Officer, can I join Beatrice Wisher in, in praising the work of the Scottish Women's Rights Centre? They do a, a immense work and we're incredibly proud of the work that they do. But Scottish Ministers repeatedly and consistently have raised the issue of no recourse to public funds. For the whole time I have been in this Parliament, which is more than 15 years now, the impact on people living in Scotland without, with the UK Government, particularly the Home Office and their disgraceful actions against women, um, is absolutely disgraceful. And anybody who comes to this chamber 
particularly from the Conservative benches, and asks me to do more for women in these situations, should really look at the system that creates those situations. So I would echo those sentiments by Beatrice Wisher and, and reassure her that we take every and all opportunity to press the UK Government to change the disgraceful system that they currently operate. Uh, question number four, Mark Ruster. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the £50 million Ukraine Longer-Term Resettlement Fund has had on increasing long-term housing options for displaced people from Ukraine. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. When including uh, the pilot in North Lanarkshire, a total of four projects providing 754 homes have so far been approved through the Ukraine Longer Term Resettlement Fund. These are supported by almost £13 million in Scottish Government grant. To date, over 400 homes have already been brought back into use and work is underway to deliver the remaining homes as quickly as possible. We are continuing to work with councils and uh, registered social landlords on a pipeline of further applications to bring more homes back into use at a time when they are needed most. Uh, Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? Having somewhere safe to live is an absolute necessity for every displaced person rebuilding their lives here in Scotland, free from war, persecution and violence. Yet over the past weeks, we've seen horrific racist attacks on people seeking asylum, living in hotels, whipped up by far-right agitators and hostile language in Westminster. Can the Cabinet Secretary update me on what the Scottish Government is doing to protect people seeking refuge from these far-right attacks? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, can I um, share uh, um, Mark Ruskell's concerns? Um, the Scottish Government unequivocally condemns any form of hatred or prejudice and indeed condemns hostile language as well. It is not acceptable that people who have fled war and persecution are being targeted in this way. Such attacks uh, will not be tolerated and we must all play, all play our part in challenging dangerous rhetoric that seeks to divide our communities. People seeking asylum should be treated with dignity and respect at all stages of the asylum process with suitable accommodation based in communities. The Home Office, of course, is responsible for asylum accommodation and must ensure people are safe and can access the support and services that they need. A supplementary voice of charging. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, both the MS Ambition and MS Victoria are temporary homes to thousands of Ukrainian refugees. The lease on these boats are soon to come to an end, and uh, those on the boat will need to be uh, housed in suitable accommodation. Many individuals on these boats have formed communities and have begun to put down routes where they are docked. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary say what action is being taken to ensure the safe and suitable rehousing of every individual currently residing on these boats? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank uh, Foysal Chowdhury for his question? It is very important that um, the, the, the cruise ships, which of course have provided important accommodation uh, for on a temporary basis, that people are supported into uh, settled accommodation, uh, whether that's through hosts or uh, with uh, uh, social uh, RSL or even private accommodation where that is appropriate. I know uh, my colleague Neil Gray is working hard with agencies to make that happen at pace and I will ask him to write to uh, the member with an update. And supplementary, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government and local authorities have exceeded the expectation with £200 million in this financial year to safely accommodate 23,000 displaced Ukrainians. It is clear, though, that to maintain the current level of support, the UK Government must commit to do so too. Will the Scottish Government continue to urge Westminster counterparts not to slash the tariff funding for local authorities so that Scottish councils can continue to meet the housing and public service needs of displaced Ukrainians welcome in our country. Cabinet Secretary. Um, so, um, can I say to Claire Adamson, the Scottish Government is, is proud to work in partnership with local authorities to support uh, Ukrainian displaced people. The UK Government's decision to reduce tariff funding available to local authorities from 10,500 to 5,900 per arrival in the first year to replace year two funding with a UK-wide fund which could be as low as £1,500 per arrival and to discontinue the education tariff completely will make the task of supporting displaced Ukrainians that much 
harder. So we will continue to press the UK Government to increase, not decrease, the support available to perform this vital long-term long work. Call question number five, John Mason. A thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether housing associations should remain independent where possible, rather than being subsumed by larger organisations. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government values the diversity of the housing association sector in Scotland, which is one of its strengths. If a housing association decides that it is in the best interest of its tenants to transfer to another association, then that is, of course, a matter for the independent governing body to make. An association must also consult its tenants about its proposal to pursue a transfer to another registered social landlord, and any transfer will not proceed unless it supported by tenants in an independent ballot. So tenants, therefore, will have the final say. John Mason. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. I recently met the management of Reedvale Housing Association in my constituency, which she may have heard of and is one of the best known in Scotland for protecting that area when it was threatened with de demolition uh, some years ago. The problem is that I think they have had uh, rents which were too low and they have not built up reserves for maintenance, but they have little or no debt and there does seem to be no need for a transfer of engagements, but they could be attractive to a larger organisation to strengthen their balance sheet. Uh, can she confirm that the management and Scottish housing regulator uh, should encourage tenants for the association to stand alone if that is financially sustainable? Can I say to John Mason that ultimately, of course, this is a matter for Reedvale Housing Association uh, to make a judgment in consultation with its tenants. Uh, the regulator has been engaging with Reedvale about some serious weaknesses in its compliance with regulatory requirements. John Mason identified uh, some of those in his uh, question. Reedvale carried out an independent review to consider uh, how it can best address these weaknesses and deliver services for its tenants. It will consult with its tenants and if they are in favour of a transfer being taken forward to the next stage, then a business case and a tenant ballot would follow. And of course, the regulator continues to seek assurance that its tenants' interests are protected. And the point I would emphasise again is that it is the tenants who will have the final <coughs> say. And supplementary balance breaks. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Being able to provide mid-market rent sustainably is crucial uh, to meeting affordable housing targets. So can I ask the Scottish Government if they will commit to have mid-market rent provided by registered social landlords or their subsidiaries uh, redesignated so they'd come under social rent, not private rent regulations? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mean, there are good reasons why um, the position is the position that it is in, and um, Miles Briggs will understand the criteria required in terms of funding uh, social housing and the, the criteria that is used for mid-market rent. I am keen to see an expansion of both. Um, and of course, we will continue to look if there are things that we can do uh, to encourage that and to, to make that easier. Of course, we do have uh, our commitment uh, to the £3.5 billion being made available in this parliamentary uh, term towards the delivery of more affordable and social homes. That we want to grow that pot, uh, working with partners uh, in local authorities and registered social landlords and others. Thanks. Uh, question number six, Carmelkin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact on its ongoing targets to tackle child poverty of any reduction in local government funding. Cabinet Secretary. So there has been an increase in local government uh, funding of £793 million pounds compared uh, to last year, uh, providing nearly £13.5 uh, in the 2023-24 local government settlement. Uh, the Scottish Budget sets out the planned investments, including through local authorities, which are, of course, key to tackling child poverty. And this includes almost £70 million to scale up parental employability support and around £1 billion in early learning and childcare provision. Um, spending decisions are of, of the rest of their budget are devolved to local government, uh, and we would encourage them uh, to make uh, some of the investments that, that local authorities are making uh, to add uh, to those um, initiatives to help tackle child poverty. 
Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the Government can justify leaving Midlothian Council, Scotland's fastest growing council area, many of whom are families struggling with serious increases in the cost of living, with a budget shortfall of nearly 14 million? How do you imagine councils like this and many others will be able to meet wider anti poverty targets with that burden? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, the Scottish Government has made uh, tackling the cost of living crisis uh, a key priority. We are doing what we can uh, within our powers. This last financial year, we allocated around £3 billion uh, to support families, including, of course, the major investment in, in uh, the Scottish Child Payment. Uh, that is uh, literally helping to keep uh, food on the, the table of families with £25 per week uh, per child for eligible uh, families. We are also, of course, investing um, over £84 million in discretionary housing payments to provide direct financial support to people struggling with housing costs uh, to mitigate UK government welfare policies. Um, and of course, that will include uh, mitigating uh, the benefit cap. Um, so we are doing what we can. Many of those initiatives are delivered through local government, uh, but I do not think it would be fair to say that this government has not uh, done absolutely everything within our power to help families at this difficult time. Question number seven, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Rural Housing Fund. Since uh, 2016, the £30 million demand-led Rural and Island Housing Fund has provided an additional delivery route for community organisations, development trusts, private land, uh, landowners and developers. In sep to September 2022, the fund delivered 164 homes and provided funding of £16.7 million. It supplements the considerable mainstream activity in rural and island uh, areas, which has delivered almost eight thousand affordable homes between 2016-17 and 2021-22. Liam Kerr. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but whilst 25 million was promised to be spent on rural housing by 2021, less than half of that has actually been spent. And what has been built or approved a mere 300 homes. And the North East got only 12 of those, all of them in Angus. Now, this government promised 110,000 affordable homes across Scotland by 2032. Shadow Cabinet, uh, Cabinet Secretary, will that promise be met? And if so, how many of those 110,000 will be in the North East? So, yes, we are committed to delivering 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, of which 10 per cent will be in our remote rural and island communities, and, of course, are making £3.5 billion available this Parliament for affordable uh, housing across Scotland. And, of course, that builds on the, the deliver, delivery already of 115 thousand affordable homes since 2007. So we have a track record of delivering that scale of affordable housing and we will continue to deliver that scale uh, of affordable housing. And of course the Rural and Island Housing Fund is demand led. We want to see more projects coming forward and we are doing what we can to encourage that, including of course in the development of our new Rural uh, and Island Housing Action Plan, which will be published in the coming weeks. And question number eight, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Social Justice Secretary has had with the Health Secretary regarding any disproportionate impact on households experiencing poverty and any other social justice impacts of the reported lack of NHS dental care provision in some parts of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. We are aware of the hardship that people are facing right now and continue uh, to uh, urge the UK Government to take action to support people through the cost of living crisis. This Government has allocated £3 billion to help households through a range of measures. In regard to dental care, the Government has already introduced free dental care for young people between 18 and 25 years of age. We have also made a commitment to abolish all NHS dental charges in the lifetime of this Parliament and we continue to support health boards to deliver NHS dental services and have put in place additional recruitment and retention incentives in remote and rural areas. Oliver 
Uh, these commitments count for nothing where there is no NHS dental provision. And I'm really worried about young people, particularly pregnant women um, in parts of my constituency who can't access a dentist. The advice from the Health Board is to try and find a private dentist. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that's wrong? And will she approach NHS Dumfries and Galloway and ask them to think again? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, I will get the uh, Health uh, Minister uh, responsible to uh, reply in some detail uh, on uh, the issue. However, what I can say is that there is a framework of support to encourage more dentists to remote and rural areas, including the whole of the Dumfries and Galloway Board area. I understand that up to £37,500 in Golden Hello payments are being made available to trainee dentists who wish to start their career providing NHS dental services. And that particular incentive has been instrumental in attracting vocational trainees uh, to uh, the, the board. And I think there's six vocational trainees placements and is hoping that there will be recruitment to at least the same number again later this year. So action is being taken. Um, I do also understand that unregistered uh, patients will continue to be able to access emergency and urgent care via the public dental service clinics in Dumfries and Stranra. Um, and that there is also um, been agreed by the board to recruit additional dental helpline staff due to the increase in call volumes to help to get Pay the person to the right place. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions. Apologies to those few members I could not manage to squeeze in. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to change positions should they wish. Thank you.